to start taping because we don't have the music. I want to say good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of our listening audience. Uh, we're back now after a six-week hiatus from the uh, studio, and we're very glad to be back to uh, tape another session of What's Going On. Uh, this is our first session without our music. We normally would start out with Marvin Gaye, and uh, this time we are kind of uh, pushing it. Uh, we don't have Marvin's voice to lead us into uh, our program, so we're not as inspired. I guess we're not going to be as inspired. It's inspired. <laughs> Ooh, I like this. Uh. <laughs> yes, I, I, I want to tell you why we were gone for uh, six weeks. We uh, taped some programs before we left, and uh, you've been watching, hopefully you've been watching the uh, segments we did prior to the hiatus, and um, we uh, went away for six weeks, but we taped ahead of time, so we would still have some programs in the um, can, so to speak. Now, this is uh, live coming at you again um, after that six-week hiatus, and we are now coming to you at 10.35 um, Monday, the 24th of August, and we hope you will stay tuned at our new time. I think we're going to be taping, uh, Captain, unless you uh, say otherwise. We'll be taping at 10.30 then from 10.30 to 11.30. Yes. Um, so, but will the show still air at 1.30 or? Basically, they'll be up there so they can watch whenever they want to. So, but oh, if you okay. get, you just, if you want a live audience, you'll make sure that they know what time's up, you know, it's going on. So, okay. So, so if you want to watch it at uh, on the live uh, program and uh, watch all of the things we do here, the mistakes we make when it's live, we don't edit anything out. Can't edit it. <laughs> we will um, uh, be here at ten thirty from ten thirty to eleven thirty uh, Mondays, and uh, that's a change in our time. As we said, we were doing our program originally from one thirty to two thirty. But now that we're back in a uh, new time zone, we are going to be hopefully as exciting in our new time period as we're in old time period. Uh, I'm so glad to be back, by the way, because I was uh, away for uh, five weeks in Africa and uh, put three of those weeks into uh, my experience in Nigeria, where we did a, st a tour uh, with students. And then when they came back on the 27th of July, after having arrived in Nigeria on the, seventh, on the 6th of uh, July, um, I then, they, they came back to the United States. Mm -hmm. What I did was to go throughout a couple of other countries, uh, including um, uh, Senegal, uh, Gambia, and Sierra Leone. And then I had, <laughs> I had to come back through those countries to get back to uh, Lagos. My trip was going to be, um, uh, my, my, my coming back to the United States was going to be uh, Lagos back to uh, Atlanta. I did not know that I was going to have all this drama once I got back to Dakar. Mm -hmm. I couldn't get back into <laughs> I couldn't get back into uh, Nigeria because I because there's a few going on that I wasn't aware of. I wasn't aware. I told you before you <laughs> left George. You know they got a little war going on over there. Yeah. See, I, I, I tell you what, I tell you what I found, what I found, what really surprised me was um, <coughs> they wouldn't let me back into Nigeria. They said, "Well, you have a single uh, entry." Um, uh, application, and although you have uh, 30 more days on your visa, you don't, you're not allowed back into the country because we have a new uh, policy against American citizens. Mm. Now, what I didn't know was the politics was that this is aimed only at American, American citizens. citizens. No one else has to go through this particular kind mm -hmm. of detail. And the reason for it is because the U.S. has put some uh, barriers up against Nigerian immigrants, and you, know, you and I both know uh, why that would be the case. And um, because of that, then they put some other restrictions on Americans. Now, what I wanted to do was just to go back through Lagos. I didn't want to go into Lagos and stay for any period of time. I just want to go back to Lagos to catch my flight back to the United States. They wouldn't even let me in for what is called a transit visa, which was to uh, allow me to go into Lagos, catch a flight, the Delta flight out of Lagos into Atlanta, then from Atlanta to Flint. They would not even let me back in the country to, to do that. So, mm. and I found out that, by the way, at 3 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> so here I am in the Dakar airport, um, stranded, can't get out of the country. So the next, that later on that morning, uh, this is about 3 o'clock when I found this out, I couldn't get on the plane because of this uh, new policy. So I went to the uh, Nigerian embassy at 9 o'clock that morning and um, told the gentleman what I wanted. I needed a transit visa just to let me in the country to get out into um uh, I get out on the plane out, out of the country. And he told me that no problem and uh, told me to come back the next day. <laughs> <laughs> That's so why you yeah. check out the country. Wherever you leave this country, <laughs> make sure you check out the country you're going to to find out if there's any <laughs> civil wars, <laughs> wars, 
going on over there? Well, you know, I, I like a little adventure, Catherine, but I don't like, you know, that's a little bit more adventure than what I was, uh, what I was expecting. I'm sure. But I, <laughs> but I, but I kind of knew I was going to have some adventure when I found out that I didn't, when I knew my, my travel agent was in New York, and we couldn't make a connection from Dakar to um, uh, Banjo and from Banjo to Sierra Leone. So I knew I was going to have a little bit of drama, but I was not expecting the drama to be where it was. I thought it was going to be in my connection from uh, out of Dakar to the other countries. Didn't have a problem there. I went right from Dakar to Banjo, Banjo to Sierra Leone, no problem. <coughs> the problem was where I didn't expect it, where I had my connection already made, and that was the uh, Leos, uh, the Lagos uh, connection back to the United States. I did not expect that, that problem. But I have to tell you something. When I went back to the Nigerian embassy the second time, they said, come back at 9. I went there at 9. They told me, come back at 10. And when I went back at 10, they kept me there all day. And then at 1 o'clock, they told me to come back the next day. So I said, I can't come back the next day. I got to have a connection because my flight leaves out of Nigeria uh, that night. And I had to get back to uh, Lagos in order to take that flight. They were very unsympathetic. And they told me, well, you just want preferential treatment <laughs> and told me to get out. So we, had, we exchanged some words, and uh, they, told me, they told me to get out the embassy. I told them to give me my 75,000 CFAs back, <laughs> and, I would, and I would get out. I would get my money back first. <laughs> so I, I went over. You, I, you I take, carried a big bag, didn't I, you? I had, all that money they give you. Uh, yeah, but, but, but they put it in 10,000 uh, bills. So it's okay. like, you know, you, you get it in 10,000. And so I went to the American embassy. Now, when I went to the American embassy that's in Dakar, the embassy was closed for lunch. They have these uh, Senegalese that is heading the front part of the, uh, of the, of the um, embassy. The American uh, agents are in the back. They, they're not in the front part because it's in, it's in Senegal, so they have the Senegalese kind of running. Thank God for American embassies, huh? I went over there. <laughs> they were closed for lunch. I, I, told, I told the guy, I said, no, you're not closed for lunch. You're open right now. Mm -hmm. Get me an American uh, uh, representative here right now. I need to talk to somebody about the fact that I need to get out of the uh, country back to the United States, and I don't have a way to get, do that. I need to talk to somebody right now. Well, they say, well, are you saying that this is not um, <laughs> uh, lunchtime? I said, I'm not saying that. I'm saying that you're open. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> so they finally brought me a representative, and I went into the embassy, went in the back, made phone calls, made connections. I was stranded four days, but I had some good people working for me to get my itinerary back in, in shape. And what happened was this wonderful agency that I have out of uh, New York, uh, a Buchelon travel agency, uh, a fellow Igbo, by the way, uh, and I have to tell you about my Igbo experience a little bit later in the program, but uh, she was working on, a, on an itinerary change, and what happened over the course of four days was that it was finally changed, and I was able to um, um, get a flight out of uh, Dakar, and I flew from Dakar uh, Friday morning at 2.45 and flew to, um, I got to New York at 7.40 Friday morning on the, on the 14th, and um, came back to Flint, got back in Flint about 5 o'clock on the 14th of uh, August. You know, it's, it's, I, I came back on the 14th at 5 o'clock. I was due in South Carolina <laughs> the next day. Mm -hmm. So I came in on, uh, at 5 on the 14th. I had to catch a flight at 1140 um, to um, uh, um, Charleston to do my research piece for the university. So I was uh, in Flint and then back out of Flint the next day. And, and so it was another week out of, the, uh, out of the city. You can imagine I'm very glad to be back here at the studio to uh, tape this program and have some sitting down time. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, I, I do want to say that while I was in Nigeria, uh, to finish this piece off about the experience I had when I was in Nigeria, it wasn't all drama. There was a wonderful event that took place where I was inducted and, and made an Igbo chief. Uh, this is a very high honor. And uh, I have to tell you that this had not happened uh, according to some of the folklorists that were talking about how rare this experience was. This had not happened for at least four to six years. They had not had anyone who's not Igbo to be made an Igbo chief. That's awesome. And so this was really um, a very uh, big honor that I... So you're a part of the history over there. I'm now part... I have to uh, now take my duties more seriously because um, being an Igbo chief takes a, carries <coughs> with it a number of responsibilities. It's mm -hmm. not just like you're Igbo chief and you sit down and don't do anything or don't represent the uh, community. So uh, they gave me... The, they gave me um, this uh, tremendous honor, and the name that they gave me, which, uh, by the way, when you get to be an Igbo chief, you have to have your, uh, your fan. In fact, what I need to do here, Catherine, is give you a blessing by putting that on your back like that. Thank you. <laughs> so uh, uh, this is the uh, fan that they gave me, and uh, when I was sitting there, 
in the um, in the chief's uh, village, in in fact in his palace, uh, I put on this hat. So uh, this, which was really tight on my big head, but I had this hat on, and the fan um, was given. Uh, this is uh, an indication of your your chieftainship, and uh, this is uh, the necklace they gave me, which is amber and it's very expensive. Very expensive. Uh, Beautiful. Uh, this is, and then two bracelets. I put you can put them on one hand Ooh. or put them on both hands. I He's gonna give me on one both. of the bracelets. <laughs> 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 uh, you know, I was I was walking through the airport and. Um, one of the gentlemen was sitting there in uh, Lagos. This is when I was going out of Lagos on the 27th of July. And when he uh, saw me walking down, um, just you know, coming in through the um, tunnel, uh, uh, he said that, uh, he told me later on, he said, I knew when you walked uh, through, the, um, uh, through the terminal that you were an Igbo chief. He, mm -hmm. he recognized He the, recognized. Yeah, even though I didn't have the hat on and this was in my suitcase, uh, he knew that this right here represented, you know, chieftainship. Mm -hmm. And this might be why I didn't get that uh, visa uh, when I went to the embassy because I was wearing this and they weren't evil. So oh, okay. <laughs> they, might, they might have had a little attitude because, they, you know, they're very, um, you know, tribal. Uh, and you would say ethnic. And classic. And classic. Classism. Right? Classism uh, in, in there, so in Africa. So anyway, it was a very, uh, I, I, feel, I feel that I have to come back now and pick up my gait, so to speak, because you know when they give you this kind of title, uh, and my title is um, in one e dina emba, uh, the first of the Ahait um, Mbieri uh, village, and that means um, that I'm a chief of the Igbo, but I am in the diaspora, mm -hmm. and that name in one e, uh, where uh, when they knew I was inducted, I, I was telling people I was inducted as an Igbo chief. They said, then your name is Iwani, which it would be the uh, name for those who are not living in Nigeria, not born in Africa, but in the, in the diaspora, meaning those who are outside of Africa, but of African descent way back when we were you know, part of the African landscape. So I was honored to be there, and um, I'm really going to take this um, chieftainship very seriously and try to live up to the kinds of uh, ideals that it embodies because it really is a tremendous tradition that goes back to um, uh, four and five hundred years ago when they began to set this up and <coughs> how it has been passed down to the uh, village. I want to thank uh, on air uh, Dr. Um, Ernest Amagnano, who is over the who is one of the, the members at the uh, university in the African Studies Department, for his um, recommendation that I be uh, one of the two persons who was honored at this particular ceremony. And I want to thank him for this very big honor. And I'm very much honored to be a part of the Ebo. Uh, nation, and uh, to have this uh, honor bestowed upon me, I take it very seriously, and I'm going to represent the yes. uh, Igbo community with um, with due diligence. Well, I think that I've talked enough about about that. I know you want to bring some things in, also, um, Catherine. When I tell you uh, one one last thing, the the kola nut. I thought uh, uh, in in the Igbo nation, they say that the kola nut only speaks Igbo. So I'm thinking, well, the, that the kola nut is kind of uh, central to the Igbo culture. I mean, nothing happens formally unless they bring the kola nut out and they serve the kola nut, have a, have a ceremony around it before any formal um, thing yeah, takes place. Because uh, uh, I got some shakers. Mm -hmm. I got the, the uh, ankle bracelets for dancing. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Well, I, what, I was, what, I was fa what I found out by being uh, stranded in, in uh, Senegal, because I went around, you know, throughout, um, you know, Senegal walking the streets of Dakar, uh, and asking questions, you know, about about different things, and I was very surprised to find out both in Gambia, in Sierra Leone, and in uh, Senegal, I was surprised to find that the kola nut has resonance in other cultures as well. Mm -hmm. So, where in the Igbo was saying that the kola nut only speaks Igbo because they're Igbo, um, the fact is that they make that claim in other uh, parts of Africa also. Uh, I know in Ghana. In Ghana, mm -hmm. so I was just it's really so I said that uh, given that uh, fact. What it now challenges me to do is go do some research to find out the central place where this would have been diffused from because if you have the same idea in different cultures where the kola nut is central, then there has to be a, a beginning point mm -hmm. before it's diffused throughout the landscape of other parts of Africa. So that makes me have to go now. And I want to do some research to find out where was that, diffu where was that diffusionist point where it started out at a certain place and then it would be diffused into other parts of the uh, continent, I want to. Uh, I'm going to be looking into that as a uh, question because I, I was surprised to find that 
they were saying that um, they had that in Senegal. I was surprised they found it in Senegal and in Gambia. They they understood it in in. Well, don't in they Gambia. have cola trees? <laughs> they have cola trees. So who yeah. can have, uh, as I said, monopoly mm -hmm. on a tree? Yeah, but but the but why would it be? Th the question uh, to me would be why would it be that particular um, uh, the cola? Why would the cola nut be central in those cultures? I mean, th why not the mango, for example, that. You know, you well, know. well, like the Kurite tree where the shea butter comes from. Mm -hmm. They call that the woman's gold. Yeah. So, you so know. Yeah, they got a lot of things they could have had, and the fact that it took the kola nut as the centrality, the, 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 the thing that's central to the culture. Don't they also offer you kola nuts? I mean, you know, to eat? They offer kola. Mm, okay. In fact, one, one way that you know whether or not there is a peaceful intent is whether or not they offer you kola. If you're not offered kola, that means that the intent is hostile. Okay. So I because um, that's what I thought they you know when they put the cola nuts out you're welcome as a friend mm -hmm. yeah that's that's a, that's what it embodies the the fact that there's you're coming in peace and they receive you in peace mm -hmm. <clears throat> but if they don't offer you cola um, then that that shows a certain amount of social distancing that's taking place in fact you go in uh, in 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 Chenny Achebe's book called Things Fall Apart his classic that's now 50 years old. Um, his novel called Things Fall Apart. Um, he, th one of the questions that is asked there uh, when you go to a person's house is, do you have cola for me? It's a way of asking, you know, is there uh, an acceptance of my presence uh, here in your abode? And if they don't have cola, they're saying then that you're not welcome. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, it, it was kind of funny. I asked one of the professors at Emo State University. Interesting. They uh, had a uh, ceremony. Uh, where we were introducing ourselves, and I said, I'm surprised that you don't have cola. Uh, he said, well, you know, we are going to have cola. We have not started the formal ceremony yet, <laughs> but we're going to have cola. <laughs> mm -hmm. So it was, it was interesting how uh, cola was central, but my education was that it wasn't, because uh, I had been in, in Nigeria before, so I saw it in 2006. What I did not know, though, was how widespread the cola celebration actually was. And so I, it, when I came back, I said, that's one thing I got to look into. And that's a research piece I'm going to do as soon as I get some of the other things, uh, projects I'm, I'm working on right now out of the way. That's the next project I've got to work on. But wouldn't that be part of the culture? Uh, from, you know, even though, because I know cola nuts are from Nigeria. That's where I got my stuff from. Mm -hmm. But wouldn't it be a part of the culture that would be passed to another country? Just like we here in the United States, uh, things that's happening in California, we get up here in Michigan. Yeah, but it's a part of our culture. it seems to me that there are uh, well, there, there, there's cola in uh, Senegal also, mm -hmm. and um, the fact that that the cola nut is celebrated like it is, it just uh, how do you have the the uh, the similar ceremony, and it just originates in different places the same way. See, I don't uh, I don't accept that that's uh, how that would have occurred. <clears throat> I think that. Uh, my own thinking about it would be there has to be a diffusionist center that it has to be okay. some place where it it, it is uh, celebrated and then there is this um, um, mob mobility which carries the idea into other parts of, of Africa so it resonates in other parts of Africa. Now I don't know if it resonates in East Africa or not because I haven't been to, to uh, the only place I've been in East Africa is Egypt but um, when I go to Kenya, that's one of the things which I, which I hope I'll do that is in that two years. Is that the next trip? No, Botswana is next, the next trip. Okay. Because um, I want to look at uh, uh, Africa's uh, success story in Botswana. Is that, and, I need, and after being in, in Nigeria for three weeks, I need a success story. <laughs> 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 I got to. When you do travel to those countries, just, you know, it is an adventure, number one. <laughs> but sometime it can get dramatic. Yes. I mean, I, just I, be prepared. Yeah, I came back here. I was really, my, my wife was saying, um, uh, my wife's really concerned about me when I travel. And, I'm sure uh, she was. And she didn't hear from me for, from a, for a while. She was mm -hmm. saying, uh, she finally wrote me and said, um, uh, if, I don't, if you don't answer this particular email, if you don't answer this particular email, then I'm giving up. But she didn't know how hard it is. You see, it's not like your computer's on your desk. And, you know, you have to go to an internet ca cafe and then you have to wait in line. Maybe the, uh, the service is down for that day and it's, you can't get through transmission problems. So it's not like you know the technologies mm -hmm. you have here. A lot of lot of things got to got to be still be fixed. But um, I finally was able to communicate and tell her that even though this drama is going on, that um, you are I, all right. I'm going to be able to figure it out. I don't panic. You know, when I have a situation like that, I don't panic. I just simply, uh, you know, try to figure out what I'm going to do and you get a plan in panic. place. 
You got to have a clear head and figure out what. Yeah, I needed a plan. Saying. I didn't need to yep. be over there panicking and pulling my biting my nails. I needed to figure out what I needed to do, and I kept on, you know, working on it. And four days after I began to work on my plan, I had a plan in place, and you know, able to. Um, and, and 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 while I was in Senegal, by the way, you know, I worked. On, I had some. Um, I met a lot of people. I met a lot of friends. Uh, people that helped me at the airport, mm-hmm. and um, some people I'm staying. I'm, I'm staying in contact with because I, I was just um, really impressed with the uh, African people. You can't beat the African people. Uh, that's beside the government. I'm not talking about the the, 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 the politicians. The people themselves um, um, actually awesome. Are awesome. You can't. And they welcome you. That's that's what it was they they welcome you. Uh, like when I was telling you about when I went to Egypt and uh, I went off the itinerary that they had for us and mm-hmm. so I, I mm-hmm. met me some people I couldn't cross the street mm-hmm. so this little boy came and showed me how to cross the street you know mm-hmm. you, it's a way you had to turn your feet because it's like bumper to bumper traffic and you have cars and you have uh, people, women especially, selling their vegetables pulled by a donkey or an ox or whatever mm-hmm. and yes accidents there, there was no speed limit, even though they may have had signs. But you had to learn to, I had to learn how to just get across the street from the hotel to this mm-hmm. store. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I met some guides. And when I met them guides, uh, <laughs> they took me to their homes, and I got to enjoy tea and cake. Mm-hmm. And I seen, you know, their bathroom was located in the kitchen. Never seen that, never want to see that again. Uh, I went to weddings. I went to a uh, Hodge where people were coming back from Mecca mm-hmm. and the mm-hmm. weddings, all this was on a Friday night and it was just exciting. I went to different cafes. Well, you know, I have to laugh a little bit when you say crossing the street. Was that because of the way they drive over in Egypt? Because of the way they drive and also it's the lanes is, you know, it's not like we have two or three lanes. Mm-hmm. They have four and five lanes right. on either side. Right. And, and, you know, and no traffic that, light man. And the traffic lights. Yeah, they had traffic lights, but they didn't work. Okay. <laughs> They had, uh, uh-huh. you know, down the sides, they had, in, like Detroit when I was down there uh, last weekend mm-hmm. uh, for the cruise, uh, the strip on Woodward that's down the strip there with the grass and everything, the trees. Well, in Egypt, these people sleep there. They, they just get out there and it's just like they just lay there, they sleep all night, <coughs> mm-hmm. get up in the morning or whatever. And that reminded me when I was in, uh, uh, when I was in Cairo how that little strip of Woodward Woodward was, and we did have to uh, even come across the street and from Woodward, uh, take your time and everything, because they have mm-hmm. like four or five lanes on one each side, four lanes at le- I think at least mm-hmm. on each side. Mm-hmm. But what was amazing is that strip and all the people that was on that strip mm-hmm. reminded me of Cairo. Mm-hmm. But my adventure in, in Cairo was uh, they took our passport, and when they took our passport, we never did find out why they took our passport. But we had to pay to get that passport. <laughs> that's why back. they took it. <laughs> Jesus. You know, that's one thing. If you're traveling uh, outside the country, the, the, wor- the worst thing that can happen to you is to lose possession of your passport. Passport. We, you know, we would put ours in the safe. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't, you don't leave it in your room. Or you could get one of those, you know, those little purses that women have. Right. And we carry them and keep right. it with them. But it's just safety, you. for your safety, to put it in there. But when they took our passports, and the, the trip I went on, Jesse Jackson was with us. It was called a symbol, symposium in the cradle of civilization. Mm. And Jesse Jackson and Dorothy Heights, of course, they was up in first class. Mm. But, when, you know, and it was so funny when we was going over, everybody was bougie this and bougie that. Mm. Did you notice that when you went? No, because I went with a different group. I, I, you told me about your trip before, but you never told me before that you went with Jesse Jackson and Dorothy Heights. Yeah, they were the speakers. They were know, the speakers. They, yeah, they were the ones who, uh, I went with the Negro Council uh, National Council of Negro Women so went, and Dorothy Height was the is the was the president at that time, mm-hmm. so I went with them. Okay, and everybody was just bougie, you know. Yeah, so but you, on the way back, mm-hmm. you want to see some unity happen? We mm-hmm. had unity because number one, we was glad to get our passports back. Some of the people, especially the women, had spent all their money, mm-hmm. and all they had was money, like when they get back to the airport in the <laughs> states, <laughs> to be able to get home, <laughs> and so. <laughs> It was just interesting how we came together and got the money for these women. Mm-hmm. It, it, you know, and then on the plane, the unity. There was no first class no more. Mm-hmm. You know, we were yeah, all yeah. together but did, on one plane. Did anyone object to them taking your passport? Because that's really serious. I think Jesse did. did. I it. think Jesse and Dorothy did because they, their passports were taken too. Mm-hmm. The, nobody was left out of this. Yeah, I, mean, did, they, I mean, they just came up and just 
ask you for your passport? They left us a um, a note, actually, and probably everybody like mine was in a safe uh, with the hotel that I was in. <laughs> so they left a thing. That's where I learned, hey, carry it in a pouch, keep my passport. Uh -huh. But uh, they, when I got back to the hotel, it was a note on the door, you know. So, and also, it was very policed. Uh, soldiers with automatic rifles, I guess them A12, oh. AK12s. They were everywhere there, you know. So it it was an interesting uh, trip, and I enjoyed it very much. Well, um, well you, you mentioned the passports being taken. That happened to me in 2007 uh, in, uh, in Gambia. You uh, don't want to lose your passport. That is a, that, you panic over that because, you. you know what, you can't get out of the country. The country, or get back into this you country can't, you without can't, it. You are totally immobile, Lance. If, you can, if your passport is not in your possession, they have no proof. Of anything you say, where you're from, where you're going, they don't have any proof of that. And it, you will pay the price too, because they did make us pay to get. Well, that was what was very dramatic about let, it. Let me tell you about what happened to me. You're talking about your passport being taken in Egypt. Uh, what year was that, by the way? When you went that was through? in '89. '89. But so it's just as vivid today <laughs> as it was you in '89. Your 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 experience was five years after I had gone to uh, Egypt. Now that didn't happen to, to our group, but well, it didn't happen to the, the University of Michigan. They just did it at our hotel. Hmm. Because it was some students from the University of Michigan of uh, uh, Flint there. They didn't take their passport. How long did they hold their passports? How long did they, they, were they in possession? I don't know. Um, More than a couple of days? Yeah. Enough for uh, people to, up, you know, uprise mm -hmm. and start complaining and stuff. And that's when Jesse and them, I guess Jesse and, and I think Jesse Jackson and, and Dorothy Hyde, and it was some other dignitaries there from the states, uh, pull their um what you want to call it? Weight. Their weight. Mm -hmm. And uh, we got our passports, but we had to pay. That was the stipulation. Mm -hmm. And like I said, some people had ran out of money. Had to pay to get the passports back. We had to pay to get them back. And it didn't matter the price. We had to yeah, pay you to want, get them back. Yeah, you want your passport. Well, you know, that happened to me in, 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 uh, in Banjul, at the Banjul Airport. Uh, this gentleman uh, had a badge. He said, um, uh, let me see the hands of those who are here in uh, Gambia for the first time. This was in 2007. So, you know, like uh, a naive, the naive traveler, I, I raised my <laughs> hand. <laughs> what did I want to do that for? So I raised my hand along with some other people. So he took our passports, he's, and so we, and we panicked because, as you just said, and, and as I indicated, you, losing your passport. Well, you tried not to panic because you got to figure out how I'm going to get my passport back. That is but it is, uh, you also know that this is a serious deal. That's here. serious. That, yeah. that's, that, is, that probably is the most serious thing that can happen to you in, in traveling. So those of you out there that's planning on traveling anywhere in the world, hold on to your passport at all yep, costs. Keep it with you. Don't put it in the hotel safe, nothing. I, I, was, I tell you what happened, though. He, he said, well. Never um, leave it in your room. When he took our passports, we said, we, we, we made this objection. We said, why are you taking our passports? He said, oh, it's okay. He shows us our badge. He's, he shows us his badge. So um, what he wants to do is wait outside the door and bring, his one, bring us in one at a time and, you know, talk to us. So I'm waiting outside for my turn. I, w I go inside eventually. And he's holding my passport. He's got his passport waving it at you, letting you know he's in possession of it. <laughs> and in control. He says, now, we're going to take care of you and make sure that your stay here in Gambia is very peaceful and very accommodating. Yeah, he's that's what they said to us. And he's writing, not, he's making, it look like he's writing my <laughs> name down. So I'm, I'm, I'm being written, he's writing my name down so that they know I'm in the country. And he says, now, uh, you don't have to pay anything to get your passport back. It's certainly uh, just, uh, but any gratuity you want to uh, give us, you know, is fine. But we're not, nothing is required. And he's waving my passport. So I kept waiting for him to get that passport in my striking distance where I can grab it out of his hand. But you know they you they know you in the country when you come through there and they stamp your passport. Yeah. So you know it, it's it's just the games that they play with yeah. you in your mind. Well, you you know that that was really a mind game, and especially and some people lost their clothes. I see so m I've never seen that type of unity among blacks in this country. Yeah. As I seen when we were there. Yeah. We, we helped each other with clothing and everything. Well, Captain, I have to tell you something. I'm not mad at them. I, I, I have to tell you uh, about an experience. I'll tell you about another experience I had. Oh, in, it's not going to stop me from going. Yeah. yeah it, <laughs> I, 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 Lord, I, bless me. I will be going I, again. I, I understand a lot better having had this trip because I learned a lot of things I did not know uh, from other trips when I'm going in and having very limited contact. Being kept in the country for four days and um, <laughs> having to deal with everybody in on, and their mother, uh, on, everybody on the sun for four days, everybody trying to hit on you, get some of your money and all that. Yeah, they I, do do that. I learned a lot. 
and and uh, so um, <laughs> anyway, this guy was uh, he was Lord. he was waving my passport in the in the in this in this little room. He's saying, now you don't have to pay anything. This is all you know. Anything you want to give us is just a gratuity. It's not required. He kept on waving the passport. I kept. I said, he's getting closer and closer. Finally, when he got it within striking distance, I grabbed out his hand and got up and walked out. <laughs> <laughs> I know he was tired. I we, knew he, we didn't know where was, ours were. He was tired of me. But now in Senegal, I tell you what happened uh, uh, there. I'm, I'm, I'm trading money. Now, the black market, you're not supposed to say this, that's supposed to be a black market. But, uh, you know, it's a black market you know, at these uh, airports because a lot of them come there because they're trying to feed their families. So I'm, I'm kind of. But, George, also make sure you tell the people that. Learn the, what the exchange is there from American dollars to uh, African money because you can get, they can fleece you, that's, hey, cheat Kath you. Catherine. That's what I'm getting to. Uh, what they <laughs> I had a shield around me. I know I did because it, they never fleeced me. They never took me for nothing. I was just truly, that was a blessed trip. You know, uh, you're talking about something that I was going to bring up, and you're, you're making an excellent point. Uh, they have, you know, everybody has a cell phone. So what they would do, they would say um, the exchange rate is, and they, what they would do is that they would hit their cell phone, and they would put uh, 460, and they would show this to you like this right here. They would say, uh, the exchange rate today is uh, four sixty. Uh, the, the American dollar has gone down now. I really but you know, you can do you can do your uh, exchange your money in New York before you even go. Yeah, I, but but you know, you on the in, in what they call the black market. What I'm trying to do when I travel, I'm trying I'm trying to share resources. I'm not trying to keep all the money to myself. I want to benefit, I but I want to also share some of the wealth. You know, because they mm -hmm. are they are hurting and they need some money and they're they're just trying to eat. Yes. So I, I don't have a problem with that. But what, I, what you want to do is that you want to try to um, lessen the exploitation that goes on in the exchanges. Mm -hmm. So I'm in this car, and the guy is telling me the exchange rate has gone down. Uh, it's only uh, it's 460 to 1. Uh, 460 <laughs> to CIFA. I said, look, I said, um, I'm getting 46,500 CIFA. You know, in other words, the exchange rate is 465. It's really 470, but I'm letting them make a little bit of money. Mm -hmm. And so he's telling me, no, it's 460. I said, look. Give me forty six thousand five hundred cephas, or get out of my face with this nonsense. <laughs> he found out you knew what you were talking about, and you, you weren't finna run no game of fleece, fleece you. Uh, let, me, let me tell you what happened to one, uh, another person that was made a chief. I won't mention his name. You know him. Um, here's what happened to him. He he went to uh, Lagos, and um, you oh, you you you're, you're overnight in Lagos because you don't you, the flight to Oweri is not until next day. Now. The international air the, the international airport is right here, and then you could in 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 same distance is maybe about two blocks away. They have the domestic airport. So the next morning, when he gets up out of uh, uh, from the hotel, the hotel transportation takes him to um, the airport. But rather than taking him to the domestic airport, the person who dropped him off t took him to the international airport. Although he's going to a weary mm -hmm. domestic. Now it looks like this is contrived, and this is a uh, all um, uh, this is really a, a heisting that's taking place, but he doesn't know it because he's never been to Africa before, so he know what he didn't know what those really? minefields are. Never been to Africa before, so so he, he he's looking at uh, this uh, the the prodigal son, <coughs> the prodigal son has come home, and he doesn't understand that, and he probably um, was romanticizing it too, romanticizing, yeah, because you have to understand it from their standpoint. Uh, if you see yourself, as, if you think that they see you as anything other than a meal ticket, first and foremost, I mean, you know, <laughs> dinner is first. And and this idea that you are the long lost prodigal son coming home, I suggest you go read this book by Leslie Alexander Lacey called The uh, Education of a Proper Negro. Go read that book there when Leslie Alexander Lacey in the 60s thought he was going home to this big welcome because he was big, this big writer. Our big welcome was when we got off the plane, they was lined up on both sides begging for money. Yeah, that, but that's they, the wealth. They need some income because of the hurting that's going on among the German population, uh, particularly in Nigeria. I saw more. You know, Nigeria is not just Nigeria. I think I said particularly. Not, I didn't say just. In, I said particularly in Nigeria, yeah, where you would think it would I be think different. It's all throughout. You would think it'd be different in Nigeria because Nigeria has this oil wealth, but the politicians do not intend to share it, and that's why wherever I went in Oweri, police everywhere. Let me tell you about this one here. Russia is finna put a pipeline in there for the oil. Oh yeah. With Nigeria. Mm -hmm. And the name of this venture is called Niggas. Yeah. Let me, let me, I'm aware of that. <laughs> uh, but that was interesting yeah, but, to but, me. But let me let me let me I dealt with this with a email that was sent to me 
uh, from around the country uh, because they were discussing this inside of the African Studies Department. Let me tell you what, I, what my, res- my, I, my response yeah, I received. Was I, I don't know if I see, received the same email you did, but I did get that well, email. Let me, okay, let me tell you why it's called that, and I want to uh, tell you Please what Please tell me because yeah, I'm putting it in the news. Okay, line. but I, I want to tell you what, what I said to those who are writing it to me from around the country, these are professors and scholars that wanted me to be aware of this victimization they thought we were uh, being subjected to once again. Uh, the reason why it is called N-I-G-A-Z. G-Z, yes. Okay, is because it is a combination of Nigeria and Gazron. Gazron would be the uh, company in Russia. So what they did, not paying any attention to American sensitivities, which they should <laughs> not have done, because they're not... Uh, they don't have the sensitivities of, of, of Americans, of American blacks. No, they don't. So uh, they said, okay, Nigeria, let's put the N-I there. And with Gazron, let's put the G-A-Z there. And so the blacks in America were saying, look at this, they're saying niggers. Well, that's not what they're saying. They're saying Nigeria and Gazron. You got it? Yeah, well, I'm going to put that in the newsletter okay, so they and, will be informed okay, you got, about it. And you got to stop this idea. I told this one guy that wrote me about it. I said, look. You're nothing other than a cultural imperialist and don't even know it because you accept, you expect your sensitivities about race to be the sensitivities in Africa. And African sensitivities are not about race. The sensitivities in Africa are about culture. And, and by the way, we, you'd be surprised of how many times that particular thing came up in our group. One girl asked, for example, in one of the sessions we had at Emo State University, she asked, um, this question about when is there going to be a president of Africa? Um, Africa? Yeah, president of Africa. Now, Africa is 11.7 million square miles of okay. land. They got 53 to 54 countries in Africa. She wants a president of the whole country, of the whole continent. I never would say a, a president of North America, a president of, of Asia. <laughs> but you know the idea. You see, you see the idea. Kind of like uh, uh, with it, the, the they, they're black, so therefore a single ethnic group. Mm-hmm. So when I was when I was in the group there, the professor was saying, well, I think it'll probably take place in five to ten years. I had to just raise my hand. A and professor said uh, that? Yes, because he was one of those guys that was in there. You know, you have to understand some of the professors in, in the Nigerian landscape because, you know, you, in, in a lot of those degrees are paid for. And I'm saying this on Don't air. do you know Africa is different countries? Uh, they didn't With know. different presidents? This guy was up there emoting on this nonsense, and I'm trying to uh, make sure that the students are not getting uh, misinformation from some of the Thank you. persons that are making this, this statement. Well, it wasn't, you know, he was the only one. I, I heard that he was one of those professors that uh, didn't have a lot of, nobody really respected his credentials. But, and, but um, people, the, the probably the lady, would have believed what he told him. Yeah, but I, that's, why, that's why as and a student, counteracted well, it. my job was to be an interventionist when that kind of information is being passed down that cannot be valued Thank with you. Um, in a documentation. So I had to, I had to call the, the professors on that, and I said, that's not going to happen. Uh, you, you even have the folding up of the uh, OAU because the, uh, it, could not, it could not function the way that Nkrumah thought it would function uh, because there was this question of sovereignty. And if you have this uh, question of sovereignty within the OAU landscape where every nation is still individuated, Mm-hmm. How are you going to have their sovereignty surrendered to a single source in 54 different countries it's where it's in a United single States, place? United States, which is states. Which is states. The United States is a country. There you go. Come on, y'all. We are very confused about that in terms of Africa being a country. See, it's not a country. It's a continent. It's a continent. And With, you know, I think, over 50 countries? 53 to 54 countries. Uh, it's either 53 or 54. I, I think it's 54, but there, I read where some people Madagascar say 53 countries. And all these other little islands or yeah. whatever. So, so, you know, even, even on the bulletin board outside of our department, we say that Africa is a continent, not a country. And we say sign up for the classes where you can learn more. We use yeah. that as an entry because a lot of people think that it's just uh, one place, you know, black folks, so therefore, you know, one country. And so it's, just, it's just really um, a disconcerting. A lot of misinformation out there. Uh, a lot of ignorance because of that misinformation. It's and, I, you know, with our festival that we have, we promote uh, students that take Africana uh, studies. One thing is to eliminate racism, educate them about uh, African-American history, and also to educate them about Africa. Yeah. And, you know, it's actually a freeing spirit experience. Even going to Africa is a very freeing experience. The shackles just seem to just leave you. It was such a great experience. I started... 
uh, studying committee. I always wondered why the Lord sent me to this because I wanted to go to Ghana and over in mm -hmm. that area. I could have mm -hmm. went all there. Mm -hmm. He's, I went to end up going with the National Council of Women and you know, it, it turned out to be a different type of trip. But I learned so much truth over there. Mm -hmm. I learned the truth about the Bible. I learned the truth about the people. I learned how people live. And that's the whole thing, too, is learning about their culture, their life, the way they interact with each other and how they interact with us, mm -hmm. you know. So it was just an interesting and blessed uh, uh, event. And I would love to go again, but I prefer to go to, to the to West, West Coast. Mm -hmm. But um, since that happened, you know, I've met you who to me is a profound professor mm. uh, that has a lot of knowledge about Comet. Uh, we formed a uh, Comet study group, uh, which is Comet is also, named, also known as Ancient Egypt. Right. And you mm. know, so many great things have happened from that experience. Mm -hmm. Not, that's why I always tell a person, uh, at least black people or anybody, at least once in your lifetime, go to Africa. Yeah, no question. Just if it was able one time, go. Yeah, and, and just travel in general because, you know, travel does broaden your scope. You and know, also uh, you uh, go through a metamorphosis. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I, in fact, you know, I was looking. My, I would have to tell you, I, was, I just received a phone call, at which I didn't take. It's on silence. But this phone call is from Nigeria. So some mm -hmm. of the people that I met in Nigeria – I know the person that was calling me. Uh, I'm getting calls every yeah, day. Yeah, you can from, get uh, from, you from pen pals. I call them pen pals. Mm -hmm. uh, I stayed in touch with some of my people when I met in, in Africa for years. Mm -hmm. They, uh, Morcia Gabri, uh, who was the owner of the Karnak Bazaar, sent me so many different things, mm -hmm. of uh, actual artifacts, you know, that I take with me now and show out, show the people. Mm -hmm. So it's, it was a very, uh, it was a blessed. Yeah, you, I, I would say that, uh, you know, traveling, I would say, you know, specifically Africa, but traveling just in general, to go outside the country, uh, for, for another reason, too, to, to where you can begin to understand how the rest of the world is living in comparison to how you're living. And how to appreciate this country. Tell me about it. You will appreciate this country. No, to out there, Outside my hotel, we didn't have toilet paper. Thank you. They did recognize American women, and they would have women uh, inside wherever we would go to the bathroom mm -hmm. in, the, in the restroom, mm -hmm. and they would give <laughs> us toilet paper. But most of them would use their hands and just wipe it on the wall. Catherine, I tell you something. I was in the international airport in Dhaka. This is the international airport. We can drink water. We can go to our faucet and drink yes. water. Yes. Yes. I was at the international airport in Dhaka. This is the international airport. This is the biggest airport in the country. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to the bathroom. There's no toilet paper in the bathroom. And I went and asked the attendant for some bathroom paper. They showed me some the, the kind of soap that they use. I said, later, I need to have some paper. So <laughs> <laughs> so uh, they want to show you how to wash your hands. I, and they had the little kettles of water inside. That's why you, 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 yes, they'd be offended if you don't shake their hands. I, you know? <laughs> you know what? I My wife, oh. was at, when I got back here, my wife asked me if I had... Um, was if I was glad I took my own food. So I carried my own food over there. I mm -hmm. said, look, I carried my own food over there because I was not particularly happy about someone fixing my food. So I went over, I had my, you know, I, I had a suitcase that didn't have so many clothes in it. It had uh, spaghetti, rice, <laughs> <laughs> salt, sugar. <laughs> but I seen uh, so much. I seen people that lived in houses and they would bring their animals in at night with them and they, the animals slept in there with them. They had uh, dirt floors, you know, and they was constantly sweeping, which, you know, you can't really sweep dirt out. Uh, I would see uh, men take showers from the water spout. Mm -hmm. this, you know, from uh, the gutters that we have, the water spouts, mm -hmm. washing and stuff, shake off, and then put back on their gavalier, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Uh, it was just, it was very interesting and a very good uh, eye-opener. It's an eye-opener, and, and it's also, um, you have to appreciate how the rest of the world is able to live in those conditions and still, yes. I mean, it's, it's amazing. Um, the suffering that I saw is beyond anything that I've seen in any part of the United States, and I've been in most parts of the United States, and I have not seen anything like it that is parallel to I what I saw I got some pictures, because uh, I had to take these pictures of, I, just, I wanted my children to see mm. how other people are living. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and how, I, I call myself spoiled. You just got to leave this country. Once you leave this country and then get out among the people, you will see how blessed we are in this country. Yeah. Well, uh, we, we have, we're doing a lot of With things. With all this mess. Mm -hmm. You know, when I was in Africa, the, the thing that broke out 
was the Henry Louis Gates uh, thing. I read about it on the internet, and I was uh, saying to some of the people uh, there, and also when I got back to the United States, I was saying it, uh, as they were calling me conservative, I said this is not a conservative idea. Uh, uh, Henry Louis Gates contrived this particular event. And you think so? Oh yeah, this is contrived. Uh, he wanted his racial bona, f bona fides where they want to show that they're, they're authentically black by having the black experience. What Gates could have done is... Oh, my God. I, I'm, I'm telling you, having read the information about how this came up and how Obama had to stand down from the position. There's a black guy... Yes, he did. Look, stood down from it once he got the information about what occurred. Yep. Um, and then had beer at the White House. Uh, that was unbelievable look, the to man, me. The man that went to Gates' house went there because a neighbor, doing what we hope all our neighbors would do, would call the police if it looks like someone is trying to break into our house. Gates, uh, the door had jammed, and th there were two persons out there trying to push into the house, and they were called the police. The police came. They didn't do what they were doing in Cincinnati. Who, they just stopped coming now. They went to investigate. And when they uh, went there, Gates was offended by them having a question being asked about him being in his own house, as if they're supposed to know that. And I'm telling you. And he thought also that they all, everybody knew him. Everybody don't know you. They are not in your brother. classroom. And what he no. did was take the distraction, as these professors are doing. I'm here to call them on it, and I'm going to continue to call them on it. We got some bigger fish to fry than this. And what Gates could have done is being cooperative. And a man, by the way, this police officer uh, was one who had done certain um, workshops, seminars, on racial profiling. Mm -hmm. He has an impeccable history. That's why that's why Obama, who was not informed, had so to back down from his didn't, position. You didn't hear that. No, but the but the black police officer was there. Did anybody see this on the news? They sure, certainly showed on Al Jazeera oh, in Africa. Oh, you're talking about the black police the, uh, officer. The, the, I, yeah, yeah, the, I, yeah. Who, I who was that. there, who said the officer acted properly. Mm -hmm. Gates was not arrested as the press tried to make it seem because he was in his own house. In other words, what Larry Elder talked about, uh, 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 being black in your household, you know, I say driving while black. Now, uh, uh, being black in your own house, uh, Gates would not calm down. He was offended that yeah, very, you know, very he? offended. I, I just and the officer that. arrested him <laughs> for disorderly conduct. Uh, and, the picture had him with his mouth open. I could just hear him spewing. Um, just spewing I, I am stuff. very disappointed in Henry Louis Gates, who could have kept this distraction from taking place. We got bigger fish to fry. We got dropout rate that's out of control. Oh, we got let's, crime let's problems. Bring you to okay. The, uh, while you're on this subject, okay. we do have a whole lot of different this things. This was a distraction. <laughs> and I'm here to call Henry Louis Gates on it publicly and unapologetically. Oh, my God. Mm. Anyway, uh, let's bring it to where the health reform. Well, <laughs> let's calm got, down some. We got 10 minutes. <laughs> bring it to, yes, calm down. <laughs> But I understand <laughs> because it, when you said it was contrived, that was unbelievable. Yes. That he, why would he even do that? Was what to do that for? What purpose would he contrive some mess like that? They all, they all to distract they, us they, from what? I tell you what. Or they, to say that we, know he's a president. Their intent, prince, their, 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 the their intent is not to distract us. Their, their intent is to uh, reach for their um, their racial bona fides. In other words. This to say being, they have had the black experience. There you go. That that I oh, am I, uh, that I am in the average. You're black. Look, I am in the average institution, but I'm just like you. I have the same problems that you have, and so on. I'm authentically black, which is what John McWhorter writes about. And uh, this idea that we're all being persecuted and so on and so forth, which the only authentication of that is our uh, our dis discourse with um, very in various cases with the police department. You know, the fact of the matter is, is this, and I, and I want somebody to disprove this notion, that uh, racism does not stop black America from doing anything that it intends to do, and it's a sidebar conversation today. We got a black president. Can we get over some things here? This oh, is, th look, this is not the America of Bull Connor, and this attempt to recreate Bull Connor in 2009 <laughs> is not going to work, whether it's Skip Gates or anyone else trying to recreate a Bull Connor in 2009. It doesn't exist. We defeated Bull Connor in Birmingham, Alabama. You understand that? We need to get and over And we got it. a black president right now. It's not just that. Uh, it's not just that there's we have no a black book, president. There is no George Wallace pushing children out of school in Detroit where there's a dropout rate of 75%. Mm -hmm. It is 50% percent, uh, nationwide and 61% where the headquarters of the NAACP. That's you, Julian Bond. That's right here talking about can't catch a cab in New York. These are sidebar conversations. And George Moss, what get the name right. What about our children? It's calling uh, you on it. The women, uh, the girls that are getting pregnant, 
Uh, they're not getting married either. I got some stats on that. Uh, but since you kind of told, <laughs> talked about we got brought, brought this up. <laughs> Let's talk about the health reform. Yeah, and Moss is back. I'm back now. <laughs> <laughs> about the health reform. And George has uh, talked about a subject that I was going to read a little bit about, but he it really explained it very well. Get over it. Mm. It was written by a white reporter, wrote in, jo- in a Georgia newspaper. His name is Andrew M. Manis, is an associate professor of history at Macon, Georgia, Macon State College in Georgia and wrote this for an editorial in the Mac- Macon Telegraph. And what George has said about, get over it, you know, and we're not going back to uh, 2009, no bull counters and all that stuff uh, that, that happened back then and George Wallace and, 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 and but let me just, little part of it, what okay. George has already said, but uh, um, we white people have controlled political life in the disunited colonies in the United States for some 400 years in this continent. Conservative whites have been in power 28 of the last 40 years. Even during the Clinton years, conservatives in Congress blocked most of his agenda, and pulled him to the right. Yet never in that period did I read any headlines suggesting that anyone was calling for assassinations of President Nixon, Ford, Reagan, or either of the Bushes. Criticized them, yes. Called for their impeachment, perhaps, but there was no bounties on their head. And even when someone did try to kill Ronald Reagan, the perpetrator was a non-political mental case who wanted to merely impress Jody Foster, if y'all remember that. But uh, uh, elected, but elect a liberal who happens to be black, and we're back in the 60s again. We're not back in the 60s again. And, 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 and George, you haven't been here. Have no, you been I, seeing no. all that we're, stuff we're, on TV I, and how they doing it? I understand the that. The hate in their face and they we want are to kill him? Look, we are, we are not in paradise, okay? But we're not back here in the 60s either, and we're not back here in the 30s and the 20s and when the black men- back when black men were, were Billy Holiday's um, strange fruit. We are not back in that time period. Now, there are some kooks that are still in this country and will always be in this country. We're never going to have... Well, some of those kooks are nasty. Yeah, of course. And they, they, they're the ones who are walking around openly with I'm not, guns but and signs I, saying <laughs> you met, you, to but kill. Here's what, but let's not do overkill on the problem. That I'm not saying that we will... Look, you know, you're never going to have paradise. You're never going to have utopianism and all that. But to say that these are systemic uh, issues is to overstep the boundaries of what we're dealing with. There are some kooks here. You're going to always have them. Uh, Racism is here. You're going to always have that also. There's no society that has ever had more than one group in it that has not had racism in it. Mm -hmm. Uh, Or classism. Or classism in it. That's just the way the human uh, makeup, you know, is. Mm -hmm. And this idea that we over, and this, this person right here, by the way, is speaking out of, of white guilt. Gates and others, <laughs> uh, uh, and, uh, which are not helpful. That's why, oh. uh, that's why Shelby still got a book out called, um, uh, in this book, that Shelby said, white, white Guilt. The subtitle is, How Blacks and Whites Together Destroyed the Promises of the Civil Rights Movement. They both have done it. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and white guilt, is, as I was saying in South Carolina, uh, you know, by the way, we, my, 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 some people that went down with me fell out with me uh, as if I care uh, uh, I, I'm down there with them they stopped speaking to me after about three days <laughs> I could care less and I'm saying this on the public air they have to understand who they're dealing with I am not a person that's going to you know, do this and get the win about my position I think you stand up and what I was trying to say to them <laughs> I, I, there's a lady that was listening to me uh, in the cafeteria we were talking and she was at the next table, she, uh, Dr. Somebody from some other place, and she said, um, uh, I just got to reading a book about some of the things you're talking about by John McWhorter and blah, blah. I said, can you come over here to this table and slap some sense to my colleagues? <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I, you know, people talk to me about you, <laughs> Professor Moore, Moss. But that's okay. George stands up for what he believes I, um, in. You I, know, and that's, I, that's, that's, that means a lot to me because I'm a person that stands. I don't just kiss either. Yeah, no, I'm not going to do that. No. And uh, I don't speak just out of... Uh, the hot air campaign either. 
I think I have a, de- a therapeutic, you know, I have a, I have a, a documented uh, source that I can look at and say this is basically what I say. I, I tell you what, what, what I would say about uh, Gates and those kinds of people, Jeffers and others like them. Wrap that, it up quickly. Yeah, real quickly. Is it's what uh, is what talk is talked about in John McWhorter's uh, book, which came out in two thousand six. And by the way, it's out of print now. You can't even find the book. It's mm-hmm. out of print. Is after it? after three years, it's called Winning the Race. It's oh a, yeah. It is a magnificent book. One that way, I, I, by the way, where I went around and found copies. Uh, for the class that I've been asked to teach at Saginaw Valley mm-hmm. uh, University this coming uh, fall term because the professor there is on sabbaticals. I'll be at Saginaw Valley as, as well as at University of Michigan uh, spreading my little uh, five cents of uh, information. And uh, the, word, the thing that uh, John McWhorter puts posits in his book is called um, therapeutic alienation. Therapeutic alienation. We need to understand what we're dealing with here. Alienation that is disproportionate to the things that black America is having here. And these professors... Uh, at these colleges, privileged in these, uh, these, these in these privileged positions, are so alienated. I mean, Ellis Coast wrote a book about the um, the the. Uh, are the, they Ivory uh, League? The, they are. They are. They, they are, consider they, themselves they, Ivory League. They are. They are. They are Ivory Tower intellectuals. Uh, they have no connection to the black community, the black in, community in whose name they, in, in whose name they purport to speak in, making millions of dollars. You think they're living in the hood as they claim to be speaking for? They're not living in the black community. The, uh, Gates was, uh, was that was Martha Vineyards. What was not the way he had that situation? Well, a lot of those people. Twenty five. You, you, tr- you know about uh, uh, try, what's try his name? 20, Otis Lawrence. Try twenty five million food. dollars. Uh, twenty five million dollars it takes for you to live on that uh, on that property. And uh, so I think I think that's where he was when uh, when he was. That's uh, why they trying to make such a big deal because I got an email about uh, uh, these uh, elite so called elite bourgeois. <laughs> People. Yeah, trying to relate uh, uh, to the uh, rap artists like Cornel West is doing but they and misleading. About, they call the, the mainstream in this alienation, uh, mainstreaming it. Uh, Somebody got to call him first on lady, it. A, a ghetto. Yeah. A ghetto girl. West. And Obama, he was a man's people. He's not authentically like us and all that. Yeah. But what's interesting is Obama and them are staying at Martha's Vineyard this yeah. year. Well, okay. let's let's keep some of it for next next time because okay. you know we get into a lot of things here. And two um, minutes we have two uh, minutes. George. We got two minutes, yeah. and uh, I'm getting all kinds of phone calls. I, I guess Nigeria is tuning the program. Want me to calm down? Say, must you the same over there? <laughs> you were over here. <laughs> but you know, I, I, but I was loved over there, and um, I think and that it's a genuine love. It's a genuine love. Uh, all they want to know is whether or not you're an egalitarian, and once they find out that you're not. Uh, you know, you want haughty, you got your nose up in the air, and got to get an elevator to get up to where your head is. When they find you're down with, real. Um, you're real. Keeping it real. They open up their arms to you. They open the houses to you. I was loved in every place I went into, uh, and I and I was and by the way, I, when I was with the Americans, uh, and we went on these trips, and there were Nigerians around. I went with the Nigerians more than I did the Americans. I just like the atmosphere that they create when, around relationships. When I got back into the, the to the states. Mm-hmm. And I have missed that ever since the unity mm-hmm. and the love of the people of for one another and also how they embrace me. Mm-hmm. When I got back into the state, I haven't felt that unity or none of that anymore. I am actually since then. I'm absolutely frightened by what I'm looking at right now. Thirteen year old girl um killed. Uh you read about that situation over there, right? Where this thirteen year old girl was a bystander to a situation, got shot in the head. Yeah, here in Flint. In Flint. Mm-hmm. And I was very glad to see some of the uh, community elements uh, led by the Urban League, I think it was, Don Demps was leading this, to have this uh, this demonstration on Welch and DuPont. Well, I think where, they're going to have a big uh, one at in Mount Carmel on the 26th. I mean, at the end of Friday mm-hmm. or okay. Thursday this week, yeah. you can call WGZZ to find out when it, when it's going to happen and what time. But, okay, we got to wrap it gotta up. Wrap it up. We don't want to have to uh, have the people uh, come out again and just talk. Yeah, right. Talk, have, talk, talk. It's Let's take some do action. something. Right. Yep. Well, um, I'm glad to be back, and I'm glad to be back with the program. And, Catherine, it's good to see you again after six weeks. You I miss too. you. And we're going to uh, be here and now. we miss you too, John. Miss you, John. And um, <laughs> John, is John, John Wilson is our... Um, uh, what, uh, archival uh, artist. When we have a question, we always ask him, "What's the information that we're missing?" Mm-hmm. Uh, but we're glad to be back, and we're going to be here now in a new time from ten thirty to eleven thirty on Mondays. See us live at that time, and then of course you can wa- look uh, look it up on the podcast production at any time at your convenience. And so, until next time, we want you to um, uh, maintain and keep going forward. Keep the uh, keep hope alive, as uh, Jesse Jackson would say. I like to and, say, just um, stand up and just stand up. Uh, until next time. Don't fall for anything. Until next time, we'll see you uh, then, and hopefully you will 
um, um, do the best we can do in terms of keeping the uh, community together and and with what's going on and what's going on. Yes. Okay, we're out of here.